literary legends and luminaries. I'm Julie and welcome to this week's episode of Booksmart. Today we are traveling way back into history to address one of the United States' many wrongdoings, the Salem Witch Trials. It's Marilyn K. Roach's Six Women of Salem, the untold story of the accused and their accusers in the Salem Witch Trials. This is one of my favorite historical events simply because of its ridiculousness and the atrocities that occurred because of such ridiculousness. 19 people were hanged, one pressed to death, five more died in jail, and two dogs were shot because of, of a belief in witchcraft. A belief that allowed the townspeople of Salem and Salem Village and the surrounding areas like Andover to accuse their neighbors and take vengeance upon those they didn't like. And all of it was allowed to happen through the church and the government. It started in January 1692 and ended in May 1693, yet it is a complicated historical event ripped out of the pages of a soap opera. Some of those hanged would not be vindicated until 2001 over 300 years later. I could talk for hours about the Salem Witch Trials, but I'm only going to focus on Marilyn K. Roach's book and how she tells the twisted tale of what happened over the course of 16 months over 300 years ago. She chooses to focus on six women, at least that's what she states is the premise of the book, six very different women who had very different parts during the Salem Witch Trials. She starts the book with the introductions, aptly named to introduce these six women who are First one, Rebecca Nurse, a prominent churchgoer who is accused of being a witch. Number two, Bridget Bishop, a woman of lower class who has lived through witch scares before, who is also accused of being a witch. Number three, Mary English, a well-to-do woman who is accused of being a witch. Number four, Anne Putnam Sr., a prominent member of the community and the mother of Annie Putnam, whose daughter is afflicted and then Anne herself becomes afflicted. Number five, Tituba, the slave who worked in the Paris household, the reverend whose daughter Betty was the first to exhibit symptoms, and it is Tituba who is one of the first accused of witchcraft. And finally, number six, Mary Warren, a young girl who worked in the Proctor household, who was one of the afflicted girls, who then tried to tell the truth that it was all a farce, who was then accused of being a witch by all the other girls, who then became one of the most afflicted carrying on during court. Roach has selected six great women to focus on. All I knew well already except Mary English. <clears throat> Let me read you how Roach has prefaced the book before she actually starts her introduction. So this is the introduction to the introduction. <clears throat> the stories are preserved in the court documents and the contemporary commentary published soon after the trials. These have passed into American folklore as hardly believable events played out by incomprehensible characters who accuse one another, or several others, of unprovable crimes, all of whom are portrayed as symbols and stereotypes rather than real people like ourselves. Yet the tragedy and turmoil of 1692 fed on basic human emotions and weaknesses, and the trials touched people personally as individuals, people with real stories, real lives, real suffering, and real death. After each person affected had died of old age of illness or by the hangman's rope, their families preserved the stories of their loved ones' fortitude or fell silent with a willful forgetting that buried an inconvenient memory, bestowing ignorance on succeeding generations. All lives are stories, and history is made of stories. And that's very important to remember, um, and I think she did this well in her book. Before I start my criticism of The Six Women of Salem, I need to address the other books I've read about the witch trials. How to write about the Salem witch trials is tricky, I think. It is surprisingly complicated. Arthur Miller did a good job in condensing the issues into his play, The Crucible. So if you haven't read it or seen the movie with Winona Ryder, you should. Although he made John Proctor much younger, he was actually in his 60s, and made Abigail Paris older, she was actually only 11 or 12, and Miller uses an affair between them as the instigator into the witch trials. He creates a comprehensible piece of history that covers the themes of revenge and jealousy and fear and honor, which is prevalent in the facts of the witch trials. I read The Witches before we visited Salem. As you can see, it's quite a dense book. It's full of information, but tedious and not easy to dredge through. This one, A Delusion of Satan, is a much easier book to get through. And then I even read The Devil in Massachusetts, but I did not keep that one. That one was written in, 16, in 1963, about a decade after The Crucible, so I was curious information had changed. I would honestly start with The Crucible if it is the first book you've ever read on the Salem Witch Trials. All these other books, including Roach's, can be quite overwhelming. The main problem with Roach's book is the introductions. Even though I'm familiar with many of the names and I know the story well, 
she fired off way too many names, even tracing their family trees in the beginning, so much so that I almost abandoned the book. And I never do that. It was boring, filled with too many extraneous details. Not a good way to start a book. I realize this is a conundrum for historians everywhere. They want to pack in so much information, dates, names, locations, backgrounds. But for even a reader with previous knowledge, it's too much. Use extensive notes at the back for other historians can then use the book for their own research. But within the text, it's a really bad choice. To counter all that textbook information, Roach adds italicized scenes where she has placed our six women so we can hear their thoughts and such. Let me read you an example of this so you can kind of get an idea how Roach has written the book. This part is from Titua's point of view as she sits in prison awaiting trial. The other prisoners in the yard stare at Tituba, who wonders again what would be happening now if she had held out against all those questions last March. But denying the charge did not help Sarah good, so perhaps nothing would be different for her. She walks away from the others, trying to get some distance between them without beating a retreat. The day drags on with occasional seabirds gliding overhead and the sound of passerby through the fence. After more time, the gates swing open and again another group enters. Rebecca Nurse this time, also returning from her trial. This older woman does not shout and struggle. She looks exhausted and stunned, a far different appearance, though the verdict must have been the same as Goods. Out in the lane, the women's family calls to her, offering hope, assuring her that they have not given up yet. One of them sees Tituba and frowns. The confession once again remembered. Tituba mulls over Sarah Good's news, testimony against her. They still remember that. Eventually, when the rest are dealt with, the confessors will be tried, and then what? When she is no longer potentially useful, then what? She does not like to imagine what will happen. A deputy rounds up the prisoners in the yard and herds them back inside the jail. She hears Sarah Good's voice from another room. One child dead and the other left behind, alone in that prison with witches and pirates, burglars and baby killers. The fierce shout rises to a sob. Dorothy, Sarah cries before a guard's voice tells her to shut her mouth. Tituba has heard that despairing tone before of a mother calling for her child. Dorothy, what will become of you? Tituba shivers. What will become of such a young child? What will happen to any of us here? These italicized segments are great. But here's my problem. You can't have it both ways. True historians will scoff at such fictionalized accounts, yet readers who aren't concerned with family lineage and plots of land are going to become frustrated and bored with the vast amount of details. I think this was a bad choice on Roach's part, mainly because she doesn't focus on those six women at all. She simply uses them for the fictionalized parts, but the rest of the book doesn't stay focused on just the six. Other problems with the book are the random lengthy quotes from court documents, which didn't seem needed within the text. Not to mention, because they were written 300 years ago, do not match our standardized spelling nor other punctuation rules. Roach also repeats the same information over and over again, which gets incredibly irritating. Probably about 30 pages could have easily been cut from the book just by editing out all the repetitious information. Some of her passages are what I would call overwritten. Rather than give us a summary or get to the point or draw a conclusion, she rambles on for multiple paragraphs filled with stuff that the average reader doesn't care to know. And believe me, I love details. I love the historical information, but let me reference it at the back if I want to know more, not while I'm trying to get through the book. Yet, I did learn some new things, especially with all the dealings of jail and how the accused citizens use due process of the law to try to exonerate themselves, and how there were such procedures in place, yet everyone in charge just kept hanging people anyway. It makes the court and the judges look even more guilty and incompetent that they had plenty of outs before they resulted to hanging supposed witches with only spectral evidence as used against the innocent. And then other things I felt more confused about. Like everywhere else states that Rebecca, Rebecca Nurse's family retrieves her body in the dark of night because proper burials were not allowed for those executed for witchcraft. Yet Roach leads the reader to believe this was not true, that the Nurse family claimed the body and then buried her on their property in an unmarked grave. While at times Roach connects the dots for her readers, especially in the fictionalized passages, bringing up issues of prior conflicts between neighbors and how women didn't have many rights. At other times, she doesn't state the obvious for her reader. For instance, she doesn't come out and tell us that the Putnam family, remember Anne Putnam Sr. is one of our six women, 
The Putnam family accuses 62 people of witchcraft, and her afterward was a letdown, as she doesn't give the reader the full details of the impact of the witch trials, the memorials, or finally the exoneration of all those accused and hanged. Even the issue of the Putnams she doesn't address. Some scholars believe that Annie Putnam was a tool used by her parents, abused even, to accuse those her parents didn't like. Because Roach is considered an expert on the Salem witch trials, I was disappointed that the book wasn't as accessible to readers as it should have been. It was like asking Dr. Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory a science question. You're never going to get a straight answer, only one that reminds you why you didn't like science in the first place. And that's too bad, because the Salem witch trials is a fascinating story, a true event that happened, yet the narrative choices Roach made only separated readers further from the material. Roach should have stayed focused with those six women. Through those women, she could have been able to tell a complete story, not a comprehensive one, but other books have already done that. She still could have used her fictionalized passages, but then focused the historical information on those women and those women only and their past during the Salem witch trials. Six women of Salem didn't come together at all in the end. However, I appreciate that Roach is told these six women's stories, stories they were not able to tell themselves. The only readers I would recommend the six women of Salem to would be those who already know a lot of information about the Salem witch trials or historians who want all those tedious details. Otherwise, start with a delusion of Satan. If you have a ton of time on your hands, then tackle the witches. At the very least, read the crucible or watch the movie um the salem witch trials is worth knowing about as it reveals how we can act when pressured by those around us how we can let fear overrule our sensibilities and how structured institutions with power can exasperate and condone such behavior i like to pose the question to my students when i teach the crucible as to who they would have been think about that for a moment would you be one of the afflicted or one of the accused or one in charge if you were afflicted would you be faking it for revenge or out of fear of being accused yourself like mary warren or would you believe your afflictions a hysteria caught like an infectious disease or simply as a way to explain all the horrors of the world like ann putnam if you were accused would you confess to save yourself from the gallows like many did or would you hold fast to your innocence your name like rebecca nurse would you pay your way out of jail and escape like mary english would you cave under questioning like tituba just to give those in power the answers they want to hear would you have been like Thomas Putnam, refusing using your children to seek revenge on your enemies? Would you be like Reverend Paris, convinced the devil walks amongst you and now you have proof? Would you be like Judge Hawthorne, despite the lack of evidence, sending people to their deaths? Would you have profited from the chaos, stealing from your neighbors? There are so many moving parts to the Salem witch trials, so many people involved, real people, not characters, all of them revealing our deepest character flaws or our greatest strengths. Thanks for watching. As always, my goal at Booksmart is to get a little bit smarter, one book at a time.